Okay. It's going to be really weird because I'm going to be narrating and there's not going to be anybody in here. Well, I mean, Trevor, you're in here, but you may not necessarily be <laughs> active. Um, so Security Awareness 4th Edition. This is the uh, second half of our CTI 120 course. So we've got um, our five chapters of security um, to talk about personal security, workplace security, internet security, et cetera. This is just going to be an introduction to talk about um, some fundamentals of security. So the first things first, of course, we need to know our objectives. Um, there are some challenges to securing information, of course, and we have to address those. We have to define what information security is, why it's important, how we pursue it. Um, the different types of attackers that are common today. Of course, there are uh, a number of different people who may wish to um, claim your data or manipulate it or, or intercede. And then how to build a security strategy using a surprisingly old school method. So, of course, there's no magic bullet. Magic bullet is a term that basically means that, you know, one shot does everything you need. Uh, so no single solution exists to secure computers and information. There's so many different platforms that are out there, so many different operating systems, hardware that may have vulnerabilities, software that may have vulnerabilities. And of course, the technical skill uh, of different individuals is as a whole rising. You know, people are exposed to technology to a much greater degree than they were 20 years ago, just by virtue of uh, what technology is available from the time that somebody is very young. Uh, and then, you know, 20 years before that, it was even less frequent. Um, so the nature of these things becoming more prevalent is not surprising. Um, so we have to be aware of protecting ourselves in multiple capacities. We have to constantly evolve our methodology and change over and say, um, this no longer works or does this work? We have to test what we have also. So these are some really big data breaches, and these things are, are going to hit the news, and, what, and I'm sure you've seen them before. Um, you know, Marriott, the hotel chain, had a 500 million user breach in 2018. Equifax, one of our three main uh, credit agencies between um, TransUnion and Experian, uh, that had 143 million. Adult Friend Finder, which is a, um, you know, kind of a, a very slow form of Tinder, I suppose, um, 412 million. Uh, eBay, 145 million in 2014. J.P. Morgan Chase, which, considering how many customers they have, that's a pretty small number, only 76 million. Uh, but 2013, that's the, ooh, that's the big one. <coughs> Excuse me. That is where we saw a three billion user breach, and it covered a number of years. So note that it says 2013 is the marker date, but we're going to see how how that timeline goes. Um, if you want to see the actual article that this came from, on the far left side, you'll actually see uh, the link included. So um, that is from CSO Online. Um, so the data breaches that occur often incur loss of multiple types. You have financial loss, of course. If we look at the projections going back from 2014 uh, up to 2018, I have not pulled the 2019 and 2020 numbers yet. Uh, 2020, of course, we're only three months in. Um, back in 2014, we started at 7.2 million on average for a loss. Um, that got cut pretty pretty close to half the next year. Held at about 4 million in 2016. Held at about 3.5 million in 2017. It's so not a huge amount there. But by the time we got to 2018, as more businesses migrated away from brick and mortar stores, uh, a lot of those 10 year leases for big buildings that were for companies like Best Buy and HH Gregg and, um, and Target, where they would say, OK, well, we've got two of the same store in one town. Let's go ahead and let that go uh, or we'll move to a smaller location or, hey, we'll just go completely uh, online. That type of business becomes a lot more uh, lucrative. For people to try and, and break in so that spike again uh, in 2018 i'm not surprised uh, if i were to look at the 2019 numbers if that number were to stay uh, in that range if not have gone back up to to 2014. the other type of loss that we see is a customer loss uh, loss of trust you know whenever you have a company that you are um, engaged with in any sort of fiscal or or informational relationship and your data becomes exposed because of 
their negligence or lack of preparedness or for whatever reason. It's not always necessarily the company's fault in the traditional sense. That loss of trust is very difficult to recover. It's hard to rebuild that reputation. You'll always hear the analogy. It's like, you know, trust is like a mirror. If you break it, even if you fix it, you can still see the cracks. You know, and that's, that's something that is very true um, for businesses that experience data breaches in the modern era. Cybercrime affected nearly 1 billion adults in the year 2017. Um, so in, in the period of 365 days, we had a billion people that were affected negatively by some form of cybercrime, be it, you know, banking issues, um, you know, breaking data, any of those things. So there's, there's a lot of um, affectation that people experience. You or someone you very closely know uh, most likely have experienced some form of identity theft or, you know, some kind of, of, of cybercrime. In 2018, it was estimated that in time and money, and we'll talk about productivity a little bit later on, uh, almost $600 billion was lost. So if we think about the GDP of most countries, um, that just kind of gets eaten by these, these cyber attacks. Uh, in 2014, one of the more notable attacks we saw was the hacker group Guardians of Peace. Um, apparently, there had been a number of attacks that had been going on kind of quietly. Um, they had been gathering information for a long time. And the, the November 24th date is when they actually let all this stuff out in the open. Um, that's when everybody became aware of it. So there were p uh, employees and family members of employees for Sony Pictures that were released. Um, social security numbers, insurance information, birth dates, lots of what we would call PII or personally identifiable information. Employee emails were released. Um, executive salary information. The employee emails were particularly um, challenging to deal with because there was a lot of kind of uh, inside baseball that got exposed. Why certain actors and actresses were not getting work. Uh, why certain people were deemed as being problematic. There were some um, there were some slurs and some uh, depre deprecations that were being uh, implied in some of those emails. Uh, so there was a lot of um, social black eyes that got passed out. And then even some unreleased films, um, you know, in, in their entirety in certain cases. Um, now, they, they were mostly work prints so that um, people were able to um, identify that this was coming from a, a hacked source. But in the modern environment, you know, sometimes people are just like, oh, well, that's cool. You know, I'll go on to whatever website and, and, and pirate this film. Uh, so there was a lot of damage that hit Sony on that one. Um, and this was something that could have been avoided, you know, based on a lot of the opinions of security experts, um, just by some awareness, some some um, accountability issues that could have been taken on. The biggest one, though, as I pointed out on that chart before, was was Yahoo, and it says in the 2010s here in the headline because um, it took it took a couple of years for things to go down. So remember the the 2013 breach, 2014 breach. The, the attack actually occurred right around holiday uh, 2013. <coughs> the real names, addresses, birth dates, and phone numbers of 500 million users were released, so half a billion. Now, as you can see, if you're reading ahead of me, um, it gets bigger. You know, we, we, we total it up at 3 billion eventually, but we go, we go at half a billion first, which is a pretty massive breach. Uh, December of 2016, after Yahoo kind of uh, admits that it's part of the breach in September, um, they say now 1 billion accounts have been compromised. Um, now we've got security questions and answers being released as well. So this is a pretty huge hit. Uh, and then it keeps going on. A year later, in total, uh, Yahoo admits that 3 billion accounts total had been compromised. Um, and this is, this is something that happens fairly often. Uh, if somebody gets a big payload of user information, um, they can often try and break into other entries that may allow them to compromise other accounts. So it's a, it's a spread thing, um, very much like the, the whole uh, coronavirus thing we've got going on right now. So these breaches, unfortunately for Yahoo and unfortunately for their customers, occur during negotiations to try and sell the business to Verizon. So after a cut of $350 million, 
the core business of Yahoo was acquired by Verizon for about four and a half billion dollars. So at that point, they would have been closer to five. Um, you know, 350 million is not exactly money that we can just toss about, I'm sure. Um, Yahoo had once been valued, however, at $100 billion. Yahoo was one of the largest internet companies uh, for search engines, free email, shopping, things like that, uh, for a good while. So, you know, the Yahoo was a very strong competitor to Google for a very long time. Um, and, and kind of fade after a while, but, the, but these, uh, these, these breaches really um, damaged a lot of confidence that people had. Uh, another attack, the, the reason I point this one out in particular is because it was, um, it was so unusual for most people. Macs traditionally were considered to be fairly safe from malware because they didn't follow the same uh, internal structure as a Windows machine. Um, there was a lot more that was preventing users from trying to get into the back end of it. Mac uses what we call a closed ecosystem. So there's a lot of control that Apple can exert from the factory all the way to your desktop uh, throughout the lifespan of your device. So it takes a lot of uh, creative work to be able to get around that. At the peak of infection, it was over 700,000 users. It was about three quarters of a million. And it used a fake Flash Player installer, kind of like a little pop-up that you get to say, hey, your version of Flash is out of date. Uh, go ahead and click to install the new one. And because most people um, didn't think too much of it, again, especially because it was a Mac, 98% of the systems that were infected were Macs. Um, it was astonishingly easy to spread. So it was first discovered in September of 2011. Um, the Flash Player got patched. And then there was a Java vulnerability uh, that got exploited for the same um, zombie process later on. Um, this made the Macs that were infected part of a botnet. So this is how you know a number of attackers can um, be able to assemble a um, be able to assemble a uh, a group of computers to handle something like a uh, a DDoS attack, distributed denial of service. So, whereas a denial of service attack can sometimes be impeded by the fact that you can identify um, whether or not one IP address or a very small subset of addresses is sending out a massive number of requests for you know, a, a TCP IP sync. With DDoS, you can't tell the difference between you know, 10,000, 20,000, 700,000 users and legitimate traffic. So that becomes uh, messy pretty quickly. So <clears throat> by mid-2012, this was largely resolved, and we got it down from about three quarters of a million to about 22,000 as of January 2014. Um, now, I have not done a, um, a back background check again to see if that is still something that they're concerned about, but if you can go down from three quarters of a million to about 22,000, and the, uh, the patches have been put in place, especially because, again, Apple has a ton of control making sure that if you don't update your machine, you lose access to a lot of functionality. Uh, and then there comes a point where if you have a, a certain type of hardware, you're not even able to update to the newest version of the operating system, so you kind of get phased out. Um, The next big target, uh, unfortunately, is going to be personal medical devices. So we've got things like pacemakers, insulin pumps, uh, even stuff like heart rate monitors or smartwatches uh, that monitor biometric information. Simply because, you know, if somebody is the CEO of a large company or if somebody is a high level politician and they have a health disorder uh, or a potential illness that is something that would, would worry their constituency or worry their shareholders, things like that. Um, you know, maybe somebody has got, um, you know, HIV or, um, you know, some uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, things like stuff like uh, stuff like that can be very detrimental because people worry, <coughs> excuse me, especially like for companies like Apple prior to Steve Jobs' death, um, there's kind of a cult of personality that gets built around these different people. Um, maybe a more modern example would be somebody like Mark Cuban, um, who has a very strong social media presence and has uh, his hands in a lot of different uh, fingers in a lot of different pies financially. 
you know, he's, he owns a basketball team and he's an investor and he has a ton of different things that he's involved in. And people will sometimes follow um, Mark's advice strictly because it came from a guy who is so very successful. So if that information were to be made public by somebody stealing it uh, from a personal medical device, that would be very detrimental indeed. Uh, and then, of course, you know, personal uh, security in general of just your, your medical information being protected is why we have legislation like HIPAA. Um, so, of course, we want to make sure that that's protected as well. Everybody has the right to privacy regarding their health. Belgium credit providers had customer information stolen. Um, so this was a, a group of um, this was a consortium of, of small lenders that were part of a federation. <coughs> Excuse me. And their centralized databases had been compromised. And if this company did not pay a particular ransom, um, the attackers threatened to publish that information. So the idea is, you know, they get a hold of this information. They say, hey, we'll, we'll publish this, you know, their, their credit worthiness, their credit score, maybe um, their names, their addresses, their phone numbers, their birthdays. Because when you think about um, credit providing, you usually have to include a fair amount of information about who you are. You have to do a lot of verification. So that kind of information can then be used, uh, if compromised, to falsify credit applications. And then even something as simple as an email account being compromised, you know, um, there's tons of situations where people have gotten into wire fraud and all things like that because somebody got into an email account, dug through and found somebody that they may have uh, had an existing financial relationship with and asking them to wire money because they're in an emergency situation or things like that. So it's... Um, it's interesting that, you know, something as simple as your email address being compromised um, on the dark web, things like that, could lead you uh, lead to you being a target. Um, you know, if you follow companies like LifeLock or CreditWise or Credit Karma, um, they do monitor certain sites to see whether or not uh, a person's email shows up. So that that way, if it does, you can go in and you can password or um, verify that any unusual activity is being addressed. An interesting um, event that's come about in the last, I'd say, five or ten years, and something I even saw uh, when I was still working in the private sector, was the existence of uh, preloaded malware on devices that are imported to uh, and sold from the U.S. <clears throat> so something I would have happen a lot when I was working at Best Buy is that people would come in um, from the Caribbean, from uh, Eastern Europe, um, from the Middle East and from um, China, Japan, Vietnam, like the whole the, the Pacific Rim, and would purchase these devices. And it was weird to me, especially for the ones that were Pacific Rim countries, because you know the the importation tax, you know, moving something from the U.S. Um, can't be that different than purchasing it from where it's being manufactured. One would hope, right? Um, and the idea was is that, you know, the U.S. uses a different LTE standard, things like that. And what, what would be done is that they would purchase, you know, two or three, sometimes as many as five um, unactivated devices and go through and upload a, a modified version of the firmware and then resell them on places like, um, you know, Craigslist or whatever else to try and sell them directly to individuals. And what they would do is they would have a backdoor um, that the individual would be unaware of that they could use to spy on financial transactions, photos, things of that nature. Um, you know, for Android devices, it's a little bit easier to do because the uh, Linux kernel that is used for Android is a little bit more accessible uh, in terms of the different vulnerabilities that could be exploited. Um, Android, of course, being an open source platform, um, it tends to take a little bit longer to get all of the holes patched whereas Apple tends to be, again, a lot more uh, constricting about how their operating system works and their uh, checks and balances are a lot more aggressive. There are vulnerabilities, of course, through things like the IoT, the Internet of Things. The more connections you have, you know, a thermostat, um, 
you know, you've got a smart washer and dryer, a smart dishwasher, um, you know, smart microwave, you know, things that you can all control, um, a smart coffee maker, you know, you can set a pot of coffee to start brewing, um, you know, from your room, you know, and then by the time you walk downstairs, you know, it's already halfway done, things like that. So it's, um, it's great. There's a lot of convenience there and it's very novel. So people find it very interesting, but the more connections you have, the more entry points that are possible to be broken. And of course the, the firmware of these devices uh, may not be able to be easily updated in case of an issue. Something that a lot of people um, also have seen is that um, they don't always think to protect very innocuous things. There was a casino in Las Vegas that actually got attacked uh, because they had a, um, a controller, an IoT-based controller, that was attached to a, a giant fish tank in the middle of the casino. And somebody was able to uh, break into it because it was a smart controller, and then by means of that get into a, um, a back door that would allow them to get into the rest of the network. And then once they're inside, they can start scavenging information, keeping eye, eyes on financial transactions, etc. Um, so something as simple as that really is very easy. Um, I've heard of you know somebody who had a business that retrofitted back in the late 90s from dial-up um, to a much more broadband-based service. And they never properly decommissioned the modems. They didn't take them all down. They didn't disconnect the modem lines. Um, somebody remoted in through the modem line that they found an entry point to, were able to create an account for themselves, and then go in through the, the front side um, interface and be able to access things. And they had administrative access, so they were able to make all kinds of havoc. Third, of course, uh, on this page, uh, car hacking. You know, the, the craziness of this is that um, we're coming closer and closer to fully automated vehicles, maybe not being as widespread as we saw in sci-fi movies like, you know, Minority Report or iRobot, <coughs> excuse me, but there are a lot of those features that are becoming automated and remotely accessible. Now, I'm not talking about, like, the gas and brake and, and gear shift. I'm talking more about, like, really inconvenient stuff. Like, somebody could theoretically, um, you know, remotely start your vehicle and turn it off and remotely start it and turn it off and try and damage your engine or just run run your fuel down you know if you have a battery or if you have um, uh, gasoline a petrol based engine you know you're still using up a lot of, uh, of, of wasted fuel there um, you know if somebody has the ability to remotely lower your windows uh, and it's raining outside that would be something somebody who could uh, you know jam your um, Windshield wipers to where they don't work, you know, they don't trigger, um, you know, the heated seat gets stuck on and will not turn off. So you feel like you've wet yourself every time you sit down in your chair. Um, you know, all of these little features that can be controlled remotely, uh, especially higher end cars like, you know, of course, Tesla and uh, BMW. There's a lot of these features that are accessible through phone apps and making sure that we have proper uh, authorization and things like that is really critical. Um, and not something necessarily that a lot of companies have put extreme focus into just yet. But as automation becomes more and more present, uh, we will see that adapt over time. The Nigerian 419 advance fee fraud scam. Something that I'm sure that you are aware of. So let me, let me go and click on this link real quick. Um, and I'll bring it up for you guys to see. So let me bring it over to this. So the... This is the advanced fee scam, and we can see that there's a, a huge listing about it. Um, and then, of course, you can go specifically into different instances of it. You've got the lottery scam, the cash handling scam, bogus job offers. Um, specifically, the um, reason we call it a 419 is because that refers to uh, the article of the Nigerian Criminal Code that deals with fraud. So... This is where you see, like, you know, in order to move uh, money from this country to another country, we need to have a, um, a deposit in order to adjust, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, with that being done, you know, you send in, you know, money in good faith and then they just disappear, right? You know, you're going to you're going to win 32 million pounds. So, you know, $2,500, not that big a deal. And if we look at these... Um, these email addresses and we look at these names, we see that they're very, uh, very generic usually. 
especially for somebody who's coming from uh, South Africa or Libya or whatever else. Um, you've got, you know, an AOL address here, very easy one to put together. And if you were trying to go in and make any kind of um, research into who this person is, there's not a whole lot of descriptive information that would allow you to uh, verify who they are. And again, you know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So if it seems too good to be true, seems like it might be a scam, it probably is a scam. Uh, $41 billion as of, um, I believe, 2016. And I'm sure that's gone on continually so far. Um, so it's just a, a matter of uh, being aware um, of why would somebody be contacting you trying to give you money, you know, out of nowhere. So just being aware of that. Here are some examples of uh, breaches involving personal information in just a three month period. So this is a very short period around um, 2014. Safe Ride Services, uh, which was kind of like an earlier version of Uber in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. American Express Travel, Yahoo Voices, FormSpring, um, UT, M the MD Anderson Cancer Center, which if you've never been there, it looks like a small city. It's absolutely huge. Um, the Retirement Association of New Mexico, Public Employees Retirement Association, uh, Beth Page Federal Credit Union, University of North Florida, Jacksonville. So you can see they're all over the country and they all have different things that were violated. So we can see here with SafeRide, um, personal information for employees as well as patient demographic and insurance information, uh, credit card numbers. This is from where a restaurant was broken into uh, as well as a restaurant supply business in Seattle. Um, the voices servers for Yahoo got cracked, 450,000, 28 million users for form spring. Uh, a laptop was stolen from a faculty member at uh, UT Anderson. So you can see that there are unencrypted patient names, medical record numbers, treatment, uh, social security numbers, only 30,000, but that is a ton of sensitive data about those 30,000 people. Um, computer stolen accidentally posted data onto a file transfer site that was not secure. Um, multiple servers were exposed. You know, you can see that it's all just one small avenue that was able to be parlayed into a massive, massive breach. So of course, you know, with all these different uh, attacks coming at us, how do we defend against them? Well, there's a number of reasons why we have to be aware of their defense. With all of these connected devices in the IoT and all of these devices that are connected all over the globe and latency being so low, um, latency just being the amount of time it takes to do a round trip transmission wise, um, anywhere in the world could possibly be a vulnerability. I could click, you know, three things and all of a sudden my IP address shows up in the middle of uh, Switzerland or in the middle of Russia or in the middle of Africa. Uh, you know, I could go in the middle of, of, of Kenya, you know, they're, depending on whether or not somebody's got a VPN server there. And you can bounce it through multiple VPNs if you wish. You know, there's there's structures that you can go through like that um, very easily if you're an attacker. Because computers are much faster and much more sophisticated, uh, you can launch attacks against millions of computers in a very short window of time especially with uh, botnets. Botnets allow you to say, I'm gonna send instructions to 10 computers. Those 10 computers are responsible for the next 10 and the next 10, and you get this exponential growth so that controlling you know, 10,000 or 100,000 computers takes uh, very little time because you're not doing it directly from one PC. The sophistication of attacks also allows us to change up the behavior of the attack so that it appears differently each time um, so that it can fool things like antivirus signatures. It can also fool, depending on the complexity, what we call heuristics. Heuristics is a um, behavior-based analysis of an attack. T attack tools can be automated. Attack tools can be um, you know, packaged in these little kits and sold. Uh, if you look up stuff like Metasploit, things like that, um, we use them for our uh, forensics and perimeter testing. Uh, and then there's, there's other ones as well, like the Burp Suite. Those all are easily found online. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are fairly inexpensive depending on what the uh, the payoff would be. So attacks are no longer limited to people who actually know what they're doing. It has to be somebody who's willing to take the risk and press a couple buttons. 
vulnerabilities can be detected a lot more easily um, because there's a lot of what we call zero day uh, breaches. We have to be aware of where are they getting this information. Well, think about if you play games on platforms like Steam, you may see something that says like beta access or early access. Um, that's before all those little holes are, are patched up. Uh, people who do the Windows Insider program, people who use um, experimental Linux kernels, those will all be giving new features, but they may also give you vulnerabilities that aren't being patched yet because nobody's aware of them. Uh, delays and updates, of course, now we have so many different devices and so many different custom platforms that patching software is a real challenge. Uh, even for people who have a strong, what's called SDLC, software development lifecycle, um, it's very hard to build it in after the fact. If you didn't do a great job designing it when you built the software, going in and trying to bolt it in later is a very challenging task. Um, and then once the security updates are, are distributed, um, it's kind of hard to get them to everybody and, and do these you know, forced updates, things like that. So putting them out there and getting them out in a timely fashion can be challenging. Uh, and that's also kind of mitigated by the last one we talk about, the user confusion. Uh, I'll go back to distributed attacks in a second, but user confusion is where you kind of incite a panic. Um, so users are told that there's some catastrophic thing that's going on, and they have to make these decisions with little to no instruction um, to be informed about what's going on. So that means that they tend to, um, you know, jump when someone says jump, and it may be that there's nothing below to catch them. So that can lead to a lot of vulnerabilities as well. Uh, and then distributed attacks. As I said, you know, thousands of computers can be coordinated against a single computer, a single network, um, by means of you know botnets and proxies and other types of puppetry. So defense against this falls under the category of what we call information security. <coughs> information security is just the idea of protecting information uh, that has been stored in a digital format, and we usually use what's called the triad. Uh, of confidentiality, integrity, and availability to promote this type of security. So for something to be confidential, of course, means that it's only visible to those who have the correct uh, authorization, and we've authenticated those people. Integrity means that the data that is presented is the data that was requested. Uh, you know, what, what is there is accurate to what should be there. And then availability means that when we say a service will be uh, active or accessible, it will be. Uh, to its users. So in order to make sure that when we're working in information security and other related fields and we're talking about um, information that allows us to communicate effectively, we have to use the right verbiage. We have to use the right vocabulary. So if we have a common terminology, it allows us to avoid miscommunicating what we mean. We don't have a situation where we're talking about something using the wrong term and possibly confusing someone else. Um, so we talk about information security as a whole, but we also have to think about what is security in general? You know, why would we be concerned about protecting information in a digital format? Well, security in general is just protecting a person or property from harm. Um, if, for example, if you have security in your home, you may have protection from burglary, you may have protection from natural disasters, um, you may have protection from, um, you know, in, intentional disasters, you know, somebody who tries to commit uh, arson or other damage to your to your home or property or to your, yourself personally. Um, and security, and this is something that is very important, so I, I have a lot of emphasis placed on this, there is an inversely proportional relationship between security and convenience. Now, be aware, this is not a relationship that goes both ways, and I'll have to explain it. As security increases, convenience decreases. And I, I like this graphic, it's pretty simple. As security goes up, convenience goes down. Now, this does not mean that the reverse is true. This does not mean that as uh, convenience goes down, security goes up. It just means that security reduces convenience, okay? So if convenience goes down, it could just be poor design. Something could be very poorly made. It doesn't make it more secure. Uh, in certain cases, bad design can make things harder to secure because you're not sure whether or not it's performing the way it was expected to in the first place. So make sure that you do not make the um, false assessment that as one goes up, the other goes down. That way, if this goes down, the other one must go up. That's, that's not the case. So if something's very convenient to use, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad security. It just means that it was possibly very well designed. Uh, but usually, if something is very secure, then there's going to be multiple points of authentication. There's going to be a very clear pathway to how you get stuff done. So that for some people, that would be inconvenient. You know, having to use an authenticator app on your phone to make sure that you are who you say you are, things of that nature. So, as I said, information security is the task of securing information in a digital format. We have to ensure that protective me measures are properly implemented and that we protect information with value to both people and organizations. And something that we have to be cautious about is um, discounting what type of information would be important. Just because it's not necessarily something that you would consider to be critical or of great value does not mean that someone else uh, would disagree or that they would not disagree, excuse me. Now, information security has to protect things at multiple layers. We have to deal with devices that store, process, and transmit information. We have to deal with the people who use those devices. And we have to deal with the policies and procedures that tell people how to interact with the products and with the data. So I like this handy little diagram, this, this little kind of nested bullseye structure. At the very center, we see information, right? And we see the three points of the triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We have to deal with storage, processing, and transmission. Okay, So we have to deal with not only um, doing manipulations on the data and being able to store it, but sending it from one place to another. You know, when stuff's in transit, like anything else, we have that whole, um, you know, a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link situation. So we have to be sure that during the transmission process, we take just as much care as we would for uh, encrypting and securing it on a, a local storage medium and being able to process changes. Now, as we move outside of that, that little center white area, we move out into our first gray ring. Um, and again, the, these are just gray and blue to, to show contrast. Um, products being our first item, the actual physical hardware, the people who are interacting with it, and then our policies and procedures. And I don't necessarily like the idea that policies and procedures are outside of people. I feel like it's kind of a um, an overarching thing. So if you want to think of this as a Venn diagram where everything overlaps, then maybe that would be a little bit better. Um, but again, it, it's, it's kind of a hand-in-hand -hand relationship. People have to follow the rules with the hardware in order to make sure that security is maintained. Now let's look at some terminology. As I told you, we need some, some common vocabulary to make sure that we are uh, square on understanding what we're trying to communicate. An asset. Now, people often have different interpretations of what it means to have or uh, be an asset. <coughs> but the easiest gener uh, general definition is something of value. A threat is something that is um, going to possibly cause harm. It's an action that could cause harm. And again, potential is an important emphasis there. Uh, threat agent, this is somebody who has the power to carry out a threat. So a, um, a vulnerability, you know, by uh, having an unpatched piece of software or things like that, um, that is going to be a method by which a threat agent can bypass security. So we have to have all four of these things. There's something of value. There's a possibility that somebody could uh, delete the data, change it, um, you know, copy it, things like that, or any combination. Um, the threat agent is who is going to carry that out, and the vulnerability is the means by which they are able to carry out that threat. So a threat agent will use a vulnerability to carry out a threat to harm an asset. Yeah. So let's take a, a look at some other terms. Um, exploiting a security weakness or a, an exploit, if you want to use the shorter term, is taking advantage of the vulnerability. You know, if you say, you know, the hackers used a backdoor exploit, that means that there was a particular type of vulnerability that was available that allowed them to have backdoor access into a particular set of software, meaning that they didn't have to go through the primary means of authentication. <coughs> Excuse me. Risk is the likelihood that a threat agent will exploit a vulnerability to try and communicate a threat. Now, we always have to degree, uh, assume that there is some degree of risk 
present. So there's, you know, you hear sometimes the term no risk. Eee, that's that's questionable. So low risk maybe, but no risk is, is almost impossible. There are three different options we have for dealing with a risk. Um, now, there are more complex ways of looking at this, but I like using the um, ADT model. Some people will say the um, AMT model. Uh, instead of diminish, they'll say mitigate. But uh, accept, diminish, and transfer. The reason I say ADT is because it's a security company, so that's a, a mnemonic that easily sticks in the mind. We can accept a risk and say that what will be will be. Maybe the likelihood of this happening is so low that it's actually worth the risk to say, excuse me, it's worth the risk to say it would actually cost us more to try and fix it than to just let it be and hope that somebody won't get into it. Or maybe the complexity of taking advantage of this particular vulnerability is so large that the likelihood that somebody would attempt it is almost nil. So that would be a part where we would maybe accept a risk. Diminishing a risk is uh, kind of like when you get in your car, you put on a seatbelt because in the event of an accident, you want to make sure that you are as secure as you can be. You know, uh, my wife, when she was shopping for her, her last car a couple of years ago, had to make sure that she had side airbags and curtain airbags um, in the event of, a, of an accident because they've shown that those types of airbags are much more um, likely to keep you safe because you're not going to your head into a window or something. Uh, if you're in a collision, especially if you get uh, hit from the side, if you get T-boned. So, the, you know, a seatbelt is a very simple means of diminishing risk, which is why, you know, police officers, if they see you driving without a seatbelt on, will ticket you. And then transferring the risk. Again, kind of continuing with the automotive analogy, uh, transferring a risk makes it somebody else's problem. So imagine that you do get in an accident. Thankfully, you're okay, everybody's okay, but your car's kind of messed up. It needs to have a door panel replaced. Nothing super critical, uh, but it doesn't look great. And, you know, you don't want your car to look junky. And it's possible that somebody would try and, like, pry the door open with a crowbar because, obviously, there's not going to be any evidence on the paint. Um, so transferring the risk would be having an insurance company, somebody that you pay a monthly premium to to say, hey, if anything goes sideways, uh, I need you guys to go ahead and jump in and, and pay for this particular car. You know, I need I need to have this part replaced. I need to have... Um, an inspection to make sure that my frame isn't damaged and replace my airbag and things like that. Um, so rather than you having to pay out of pocket for that stuff, you have this, this transfer uh, option. So this is an example that they had in the text originally. Um, I wasn't really fond of it simply because the graphic that was attached wasn't exactly um, culturally sensitive, let's say. Um, the... Uh, I'm from a Hispanic background, so it was a it was it was a cholo essentially who was, you know, going to bust through a fence and steal some rims. And I'm like, come on, man, let's not play the stereotype. The terms that we've talked about already, assets, threats, threat agents, vulnerabilities, exploits, and risk, are going to be attached to the idea of a car with some fancy wheels. You know, the 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 rims of the car. You know, low profile tires, larger than average wheel size. So the asset is the rim itself for the for the tire and the threat is that someone will steal it okay seems legitimate the thief is the threat agent and the vulnerability is let's say that where you're parked you are in a fenced in area but there's a hole in the fence and the idea is that if that person climbs through the hole in the fence there's nothing really to impede them from putting your car up on on blocks you know maybe there's no security cameras in that area maybe um, police or other security do not patrol that area aggressively, you know, entirely possible. Uh, so our risk at that point is that the rims will be stolen. The comparative in information security would be instead of rims, let's think of a database of employee information. Some of the stuff we talked about in the breaches earlier. The threat is that that data will be stolen, possibly that it will be uh, corrupted, manipulated or deleted. The agent for the threat would be something like a, a physical attacker, like a person, uh, a virus, or <coughs> excuse me, a flood, uh, somebody who's trying to uh, flood a database with information that would be erroneous or, or not even make sense. The vulnerability is a defect in software. Let's say that we have um, an, an email server that has not been patched, 
So now there's a security bug that somebody can use to send a virus through the system. And the risk is, is that that information will then be stolen. The attacker sends the virus through, the virus collects the information and sends it back um, to the attacker through some you know, spoof email address and they're able to download it. So what's the importance of information security beyond the obvious? Well, of course, we want to prevent data theft, but we also want to prevent identity theft because the data that is stolen could be used to construct a false identity or to steal someone else's. Avoiding legal consequences, you know, if we're not protecting the data of our customers or clients, then we could be legally culpable. Um, maintaining productivity, that's a big one. And then foiling cyber terrorism. And cyber terrorism, of course, is a very broad topic, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So, of course, data theft would be something as simple as business information, a personal credit card number, um, you know, quarterly business reports for a particular company that state that maybe they're not doing as well as people had thought. Maybe there is a uh, proprietary design for a new engine or, you know, some kind of widget that uh, a competitor would pay a lot of money for. Identity theft, of course, is stealing a person's information, but using that information specifically to impersonate the victim, usually uh, motivated by financial gain, trying to uh, open lines of credit or accounts, trying to um, commit mail fraud, things like that. Now, legal consequences. There's a ton of things where people could be um, basically exposing information that would be legally actionable. So let's say that you had, you know, let's, let's just call it a, a random disease. It, it's not deadly. It's not really anything. It's just embarrassing for whatever reason. Just call it the heebie-jeebies. You randomly just jump up and down and scream. Um, you're able to keep it under control, though. You've got medication. It's all good. Well, if, you know, you had a friend that blabbed about it to other people and everybody starts making fun of you, then that would kind of stink. That would be inconvenient. Now, again, we could scale that up to any number of different disorders or diseases or things like that. And that kind of data privacy violation uh, is something that affects millions of uh, people across the globe um, of, of all shapes and sizes. So there are laws that get instantiated. Of course, we'll pay attention specifically to the U.S. because that's where we live. Um, regarding electronic data privacy. Now, we are not a great country when it comes to data privacy. The UK uh, has a much more extensive data privacy act than we do. But we do have some different uh, compartmentalized acts that allow us to do a little bit easier um, division of, of duties, as it were. HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, makes sure that um, the only people who have access to your health information are people who have been given permission expressly. <coughs> The, um, the Sarbox or Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, this dealt with corporate auditing and transparency uh, regarding companies that deal in um, securities, uh, deal with, um, uh, with investment in securities. The Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, or uh, GLIBA, as it is sometimes called, this allowed the consolidation of companies that had separate banking and insurance branches uh, and it was a partial repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. Not necessarily something um, that we want as consumers, but the banks and insurance claimed um, that it allowed them to make sure that data privacy was maintained in a much more um, robust capacity. I don't know necessarily I believe that, but that was the argument. Um, the California Database Security Breach Act of 2003, relatively recent, last 20 years, uh, California SB 1386 amended civil codes regarding the privacy of personal information. So if you are in the state of California, there are um, different websites that um, I've seen specifically recently that you have the ability to opt out of them selling your information. So you can actually, if you, if you are a resident of California, you can check this box and they have to um, allow your information to be kind of dismissed, as it were. They could do it in aggregate form but they can't sell uh, your specific information, which is something that they could do under other normal conventions. This is one of the first many, uh, first of the many US breach notification laws um, that kind of tied into that. So the, the breach act specifically just identified that if you are um, a company that does business in California at the time, 
um, and there was a breach on your databases, you were required to notify um, anybody that it was affected by within, uh, I believe, 48 to 96 hours. Um, and then there was reasonable um, accommodation if you found that there were more people that were part of the breach as time went on. But as long as you were maintaining transparency, you were still considered to be in compliance. Now, after an attack occurs, you know, we have to find a way to get back to our new normal, if you will. So after an attack, cleaning up diverts resources, of course. You know, the IT team is scrambling to make sure everything's updated and try and figure out what data might have been manipulated or uh, what might have been compromised. So analysis of all of this and getting everybody back to normal in terms of getting back to work, you know, let's say that you're a banking company, making sure that all of your clients' accounts are normal and getting back to the business of doing business uh, can take time. So let's look at a, a general table of some things that we would see uh, in terms of the cost of these attacks. So the total number of employees um, that a company has, the hourly salary of those employees. So we can calculate if it takes a total number of employees that make X amount of money, we can calculate that out. So if we have 25 an hour average and we have 100 employees, that's $2,500 an hour being spent on salary. Now, in this case, we have one employee combating the attack. It's relatively small. The number of hours it would take to stop the attack and clean it up that they wouldn't be doing their normal duties would be about 48. Uh, and the total amount of lost salary would be about $4,000. So somewhere around, you know, an hour and a half, two hours worth of actual salary lost um, simply because there were some diversions. You know, there were some people who were able to keep working. Other people may not. The hours of productivity lost to being able to generate money to pay those salaries was closer to 81. So 81 hours of productivity that somebody could have been turning around. Um, so that's that's a lot of cost. You know, I mean, if we're talking twenty five hundred dollars an hour to pay your employees to be there and you're losing 81 hours of productivity, that is not a small amount of money. Now, this is not a linear scale, meaning that going from 100 to 500 employees does not mean that it's gonna take five times as long. It does not mean that it is going to cost five times as much. So I'm, I'm gonna skip 250 because the math doesn't fill out the same way, but it's close. Um, at 500 employees at $30 an hour on average, it now takes five employees to combat the attack. So that is that is a linear scale. Um, it doesn't take five times the amount of time because you have more people. Um, so we have more people working efficiently. So we're able to do it in about double the time, maybe a little bit less, uh, as opposed to what would be, you know, what, 240 hours or something crazy like that. <clears throat> so a third of what we would have expected if we did a linear scale. Uh, and then lost salaries, instead of what we would expect to be about 20000 instead comes out to be about 29000 28 to 29000 And the hours of lost productivity, instead of being about 80 times 5 being 400, uh, instead we see 480, so it's about six times. So again, nonlinear, but definitely a crazy expansion. Now, let's go ahead and look at the 500 to 1000 This is the same hourly salary. We assume it's going to be double the number of employees to combat the attack. So there that is. Uh, doesn't take the double the number of hours, which is good, because, again, the more hands you have, many hands make fast work, as they say. Um, instead of doubling the lost salaries from 28 to, you know, 56, we're instead looking at a scalar of almost 10, um, uh, roughly 9, uh, $220,000 lost in salaries. And then the productivity time is not double, it's triple what we saw uh, at the 500 range. So we see that this expansion um, is, is pretty crazy um, you know, for large companies. So imagine if you're a company like Walmart or Northrop Grumman or anything like that that has you know, thousands or uh, tens of thousands of employees, maybe more, that kind of attack you know, for somebody like Sony maybe would be pretty ridiculous. You know, 47,000 employees had their stuff compromised and it wasn't like that was everybody they had working for them. So be aware that these attacks definitely um, have a heavy cost, even for smaller businesses. So, of course, we also have to talk about cyber terrorism, the idea that there are uh, premeditated, politically motivated attacks against computer systems. These are intended to cause panic, provoke violence, or cause financial catastrophe. 
So there's a social aspect and there is a financial aspect in this case. So what are some different targets? The banking industry, of course, you know, money, money motivates everything. Uh, air traffic control centers. Imagine how insane somewhere like uh, Hartsfield in Atlanta or um, O'Hare in Chicago or uh, LAX in California or SeaTac in Washington. If any of those airports that had so many planes coming in and out and in and out uh, and have to be operate a well-oiled machine, if any of those uh, places had their air traffic control centers go black, essentially, um, and pilots were essentially just circling going like, okay, we don't know if it's safe to land, uh, that would be absolutely crippling to a number of industries. You know, people have to commute for a living, people who are doing um, medical transport for organs or, you know, uh, vaccines, things like that. Um, really, really scary stuff, you know, stuff we don't really think about. Water systems. Imagine if you open the tap and nothing came out. Normal day, nothing weird. And you don't get that weird, like, pipe rattling, like, oh, maybe, you know, CFPUA is doing some work and they've got a pipe open and it'll come out in a second or things like that. Or if you're in places like Flint, Michigan, where the water quality is so bad. Now, granted, that was more through neglect. But imagine that it was part of a terrorism issue. Um, maybe the water pressure is too high and it's bursting pipes, so now the water can't get to. Maybe the water pressure is too low and it can't go as far as it needs to through the pipes. Um, you know, all of these things are usually remotely controlled um, at a central area. So if a cyber terrorist was able to get in and manipulate those control systems, all of a sudden, you know, you don't have fresh running water. And a lot of people don't think about how uh, important fresh water is until you don't have it. So just be aware that these these targets are not necessarily going to be the big things you think of. It's not always going to be government buildings. It's not always going to be banks. It's not always going to be big shopping centers. It may be something as simple as the traffic lights um, in a town. You know, they'll set everything to be green and people are cutting across thinking that it's a green light at 45 miles an hour. Uh, and then people could be very easily injured or die. So who are these people? Well, there's several categories. Cyber criminals, which is pretty generic. Script kiddies, which I hate the name, but it's, it's what we use. Spies, insiders, cyber terrorists, which is different from cyber criminals. Uh, hacktivists, which are not so different from cyber terrorists. It's just their motivations are a little bit different. Um, you know, you've always heard the phrase, um, history is written by the people who won or by the victors, depending on how you look at it. Um, I had a student called Victor in my class one semester, and he thought that was absolutely hilarious. It's like, history is written by the victors. Fantastic. He had an accident. He was, he was a very cool guy. Um, very smooth. <laughs> Government agencies, of course, these are uh, attackers in their own right. I don't mean to display, uh, downplay that, but governments have committed a number of uh, of cyber attacks over the years that have been exposed, um, not only against foreign powers, but against their own people. So the generic definition of a cyber criminal is uh, a person who launches an attack against other users and their computers. Um, specifically, this is usually a loose network um, of highly motivated attackers. They usually work in, in um, small groups. Sometimes it may be part of larger gangs. Um, they can target individuals, they can target groups, they can target businesses, they can target governments. Any number of different targets, is, it doesn't really matter. They, they don't have a problem with scale, as it were. Now, cyber criminals, especially in the in the big game, if you will, the, the national international game, uh, tend to have a couple of characteristics. Countries that have a number of cyber criminals present tend to have strong technical universities. They tend to have low incomes so that the risk uh, and the reward are disproportionate. The risk may be high, but the reward is substantially higher. Uh, there's an unstable legal system, and there are tense political relations between um, a country that maybe has been recently formed and a, a country that they're attacking. So there may be extradition laws or things like that. Uh, if there's an unstable legal system, there may just be a, a problem with having laws that actually define that this is a problem. Um, I talk about this in different classes because it's always funny. I was given a book called uh, Wearing This Garment Does Not Allow You to Fly. And it was a tag that was inside of like a superhero Halloween costume. And if Jeff Foxworthy taught me anything when I was younger, it's that there's no warning label that exists on anything 
that hasn't come from somebody actually attempting to do whatever they're telling you not to do. Um, the strong technical universities and low income thing, they're kind of pointing that at the Soviet Union. And again, this was 2014. So this was well before um, the whole, you know, Russian interference, accusations of collusion thing and, um, you know, Putin being so big in the news. Because the Soviet Union kind of dissolved out of nowhere, there was a lot of colleges. <laughs> excuse me, colleges and universities that instead of teaching state mandated communist ideology, they started teaching tech. Um, they took, you know, old stuff that they were able to buy a surplus. And in certain cases, they were able to get humanitarian aid to buy new machines, things like that. And they were transitioning to um, individuals who were basically on the dole. They're on the, the public um, welfare system. Um, needing new employment. So they were telecommuting and things like that. And the only way to do that was to get good at working with these machines. Um, so that that was a, a real hotbed for people to be uh, in this this list of, of characteristics in the Soviet Union. Uh, script kiddies. These are um, well, they're jerks, essentially. These are attackers who lack the knowledge to perform attacks alone. They don't have the technical skills. So they go out and they purchase or, or download an automated attack kit. Um, and over 40% of the attacks committed require low or no skills to, to uh, carry out. So we can see here kind of a little pie chart, 41% um, if you say low to no skill. Uh, moderate skills make up uh, about, about half, 44%. And then only 15% is high skills. So for a lot of stuff, you know, you look at if I have no skills, uh, in something, generally, it's not something that you can do. It's something that you're excluded from. But in the case of, of computer hacking, it's become a little bit easier because user interfaces have become more um, user friendly. They're more indicative of what it is it's actually doing. And then there are these automated kits. And then just kind of scratching the surface, by the time you get to the low skill set, you're, you're in the, you know, two out of five. You know, it's a pretty good percentage. Uh, and then once you've, you've spent some time working with these machines and you get in uh, a little bit of practice, then you can start moving into the moderate skills category. So it really doesn't take as much time as it used to to be able to write a program or to run a script um, that could possibly net you a great deal of reward. Although if you're a U.S. citizen, at least, um, there's an incredible amount of risk. The punishment for cybercrime uh, in the U.S. is astonishingly high, which it, it should be. There's a lot of uh, potential victims that can be taken out in a very small period of time. Spies, of course, um, you know, definitely feels like a James Bond movie when you talk about it. But it's true. There are people who uh, their entire goal in life is stealth and espionage. They are hired to break into a computer and steal information. This is not like a script kitty or, or anybody else that they're randomly looking for computers that are unsecured. They are hired to specifically attack a, a system that belongs to a target, somebody that they are trying to go after that they've been hired to, to go after. So the goal is let's break in. Let's get what we need and not draw attention to what we've done. So this is usually not about defacement. This is not about uh, deletion, damage, things like that. This is break in, make a copy, examine whatever it is, and then get out. These are generally the people in that top 15% that have very strong computer skills, and they're able to cover their tracks extremely well. Uh, insiders, this is something that's pretty massive. Uh, and organizations own employees, contractors, and business partners. Um, so people who had a vested interest in the company at one time or maybe still do. And one study showed that almost half of the breaches uh, that they were able to assess were caused by insiders accessing information. Now, this may not be voluntary uh, in terms of malice. Uh, it may just be that they were like, oh, I have access to this. I wonder what's in there. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're accessing something they shouldn't. Uh, and somebody's able to violate their machine. So now they're... Um, access is going on. So um, it, it's just, a, it's a, again, a spread thing. Um, kind of like the whole thing with the insider trading that was going on with the senators earlier this month, uh, which nobody I'm sure is very happy about. Most insider attacks deal with sabotage or theft of intellectual property. Um, so you're either damaging somebody's systems or you're taking something that they are intending to profit from. Uh, most sabotage will actually come from employees who have been demoted reprimanded or have left the company. Um, so, you know, if you're nursing a grudge, the anonymity of the internet or perceived anonymity, uh, and you're like, you know what, 
to heck with these guys. I'm going to, I'm going to hit them where it hurts. I know exactly where uh, a particular piece of information could be sold or how damaging it would be if they lost this particular server or this database or whatever. Cyber terrorists um, traditionally are a little bit different from cyber criminals because again, excuse me, they have a different motivation. They're usually motivated by an ideology. There are some set of ethos that they say, this is why we do this. Um, you know, they may be part of an extremist group. They may be part of an anarchist group. Who knows? Um, but their goals are to deface, uh, deny service, and cause outages. So they go ahead and spread misinformation, propaganda, corrupting data, um, removing the ability of people to access particular resources. Now, on the flip side of this coin, hacktivists are definitely motivated by ideology. They usually will direct attacks at specific websites. They may promote a specific political agenda or retaliate for a prior event. So something like uh, Darfur, the Armenian Genocide, the Holocaust, things like that. Um, but the problem is a hacktivist and a cyber terrorist <clears throat> in, in rough definitions are the same thing. It just depends on whether or not you're considered to be ethically on the right side of history. So it's important to understand that um, hacktivism and cyber terrorism are both doing something illegal under most circumstances. They are attacking a website or whatever else um, by doing things to it that were not intended, which is, again, in violation of, of, of law regarding uh, computer behavior. So we have to make sure that we do not lionize uh, or demonize without going a little bit deeper into what actually happened with a particular event. Um, it's very easy to, you know, rally with things like um, with, with Anonymous or uh, various other ha hacker groups, you know, OPSEC, things like that. Um, towards just like, yeah, sticking it to the man. But again, um, if you are hit with some blowback because of that, then all of a sudden it's just like, wow, those guys suck. Like all of a sudden, you know, Xbox Live is down for a month because they did this stupid attack because they were complaining about, you know, Microsoft changing the color on the background of a website, which believe me, um, I spent enough time on internet message boards. There are people who have way too much time and way too much skill uh, than just start fires, you know, electronically speaking. And then of course, government agencies. These, uh, these are guys that may instigate attacks against their own citizens or against foreign governments. So just some examples would be like um, the flame malware. This was targeted at computers in the Middle East, um, specifically you know, places like the United Arab Emirates, Iran. Iran gets a lot of heat because um, the idea is when you become a nuclear power, um, there's a level of grudging respect that the rest of the world kind of has to give you. Um, and they are talking about nuclear enrichment for purposes of energy, removing dependence on oil which in and of itself is something that is, um, is to be considered beneficial for most people. But the enrichment process for making uranium and other nuclear fuels um, viable for use in a power plant is exactly the same process as enriching it for purposes of building nuclear weapons. Um, it's just, it goes on longer. There's a more complex process that continues. So if they're allowed to make power-based nuclear fuel, would they be preventable from making a potentially weaponized version of this? So that's the argument that a lot of people have against it. And Iran's like, we want nuclear power. We want to get away from fossil fuels. And the rest of the world's like, no, 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 no bombs for you. Um, and it's a really strange argument because you can see both sides. You know, there, I'm sure there are people uh, in Iran who are just like, you know, we want to try and make our country more viable on the world stage. Um, we're not trying to become aggressive, but there may be people who are like, we absolutely want to become aggressive because we have, you know, Russia and, you know, Japan and China and the U.S. and India having nuclear weapons hanging over us. And we have no way of defending ourselves in the event of uh, an escalated conflict. In any event, um, as I said, it, it, Orion is pretty much involved in all three of these. Uh, but Flame was a cyber espionage toolkit. It used Lua and C++ compiled code 
um, in order to incorporate different modular elements. So different plugins could be loaded after the, um, the malware itself was present on the machine. And it was fairly large for a standalone malware. It was about 20 megs. Uh, most of them tend to be less than five simply because they're usually very small scripts. Uh, and then they you know, come in, they, they scavenge information, then they're out. Um, the Stuxnet malware, this targeted a nuclear plant near the Persian Gulf in Iran. It was believed to have been created by U.S. and Israel to destabilize nu uh, the nuclear program of Iran. And the Iranian government was uh, also monitoring the email of 30,000 citizens trying to track down dissidents because um, Iran is a bit more of a police state than most people are aware. Um, so it's important to understand that you know nobody's really innocent in this. Um, countries that are carrying out these attacks are guilty of transgressions against you know other nations, sovereign nations, and then countries that are um, suppressing the rights of their citizens and potentially trying to weaponize. That is not to be lauded either. So how do we produce a defense plan? Well, it's often recommended that we think about it in very simple terms. And uh, when I say simple, I'm talking about medieval defense. So there are four key elements to building a comprehensive security strategy, at least just on the surface. We wanna make sure that the attacks that come are blocked in as much as is possible. We wanna make sure that if there are new attacks that we have defenses that are updated and that we're proactive in this, we need to update our defenses um, as soon as we see that there is a flaw. We need to find a way to minimize our losses. So once an attack comes in, how do we put out the fire? <coughs> Excuse me. And how do we send secure information in the event of needing to call for aid or, or transmit uh, other information that we do not want intercepted? So let's look at a castle, a medieval castle. It's designed to block attacks. You know, if you have a, a, a bunch of guys on foot and on horseback with bows and arrows, it's very difficult for them to get through stone with arrows. Um, you may also have a moat filled with water so people can't creep along the wall or try and scale it or put up ladders. And the idea is, is that we have a perimeter. We have something that separates the inside and outside of a particular area to where inside we have a little bit more of a relaxed environment because people feel safe um, because of those preventatives. In a computer network, we have to be aware of um, not only perimeter security where we have a firewall or something else, but we also have local security on each of our machines. Um, so we have a, a network established where we have a strong outside as well as a strong inside in order to prevent possible damage. Um, so we have the castle versus the computer. Very simple. It's, it's, it's actually not that far apart. I mean, the term firewall comes through the idea of if a fire starts, how long will it take for it to heat up and burn through uh, the wall from one place to another and allow the fire to spread. So if we can contain it using these um, fire resistant materials, then that would of course be better. Now, in the medieval period, there were a lot of leather shields that came around. So the idea was is that you have this wooden frame because um, working metal was a little bit more difficult at that point. A lot of arrows were actually made out of what were called napped flints where you would take a flint uh, stone and uh, bang a rock against it in order to chip off edges in order to make it very sharp. Um, metalworking came about a little bit later on in a more uh, aggressive form. You know, the medieval period, yeah, of course, they had steel armor and, and swords, but when we're talking about the earlier aspects and usually the poorer countries, um, you would take a big um, shape of wood uh, and then you would wrap leather over the top of it over and over and over. So animal hides would be uh, tanned and toughened that would make them um, resistant to arrow penetration. And even if the arrow did hit the shield, um, it would slow down. Deceleration was the name of the game. The arrowhead would hit, and it would go through layer upon layer of this leather and eventually hit the wood uh, so that it didn't hit the person holding the wood. Um, now, once a flaming arrow came about, you know, they'd either coat the uh, head of the arrow in something that was uh, burning, or they would wrap a um, bundle of cloth right behind the head and ignite that. The idea was then that all the materials that were used to tan the leather usually left it reasonably flammable um, and the, the flame was being held against it. So then you were basically holding a burning disc. So that wasn't quite so good for the person holding the shield. All of a sudden you have to abandon your shield because otherwise you're, you're carrying uh, a bonfire with you. 
So in order to prevent that, they had to move into, as I said, moving into making um, iron tools, bronze tools, and eventually steel uh, armor. So we have to continually update our defenses. Um, you ever heard the phrase, bring a knife to a gunfight? That's the idea is that, you know, if you're, if you're fighting with swords and somebody comes up with a pistol, they don't have to be in range to block your attack. They can just shoot you from where they stand. And then, of course, we move up to the nuclear option to where you can de decimate an entire city. Um, so we have to continually update our defenses to prevent um, new attacks from stealing our information. So the idea, too, is that, you know, maybe we can't necessarily upgrade on the fly. But we can find ways to mitigate our losses. We can try and prevent that flaming arrow from taking us all the way out. So we have a bucket of water nearby to put that arrow out. So the idea is that some attacks will get through the perimeters and defenses. And in order to protect ourselves, we have to take action in advance. We have to make backup copies of data. We have to institute a recovery policy. We have to have these laws um, already present in our infrastructure so that that way, if something goes wrong, we have a way of making sure that we lose as little as possible. So the fourth piece is being able to send information securely. Let's say that we are under siege or under quarantine. Dun -dun -dun. And we need to be able to send information to someone, um, but we want to make sure that that information is kept private. Maybe there's something in there um, that is not something we want to share. Whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, in the old days, they would send a messenger on horseback, usually under cover of night, somebody who was lightweight on a fast horse um, and had a, a kind of a back door out of the castle that was away from where the, the siege uh, may be being held. In the computer environment, of course, we have encryption. We can scramble data so that eyes can't be uh, upon it uh, easily, and we can establish secure links using IPv6, tunneling, VPNs, uh, in order to make sure that the route is safe. So let's say that we have um, a band of, of individuals who are able to go out and kind of scout ahead and make sure the path is clear before the messenger leaves the castle. So there's our chapter summary. I'm not going to bother you with reading that. But that is uh, chapter one of the security section for CTI 120. I will uh, try and have this video up for you as soon as possible. If you have any questions or concerns, as always, you can contact me via email, via my office hours, via Google Hangouts. Smoke signal, but I might not be outside enough to see it. Uh, but other than that, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will be moving into my office hours now.